Welcome to the Church Safety Guys broadcast with hosts James McGarvey, Paul Buckner, and Mike Scully. Together, they make up the Church Safety Guys. Their mission, to equip, train, and disciple church safety teams. Join us for the next hour as we talk about all things church safety and security. Don't forget to like our Facebook page, join one of our church safety and security communities online, and share this broadcast with your church. Well, good evening and welcome to the Sunday night broadcast of the Church Safety Guys. I am James and I am joined by my co-host and cohort in crime, Paul Buckner. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) You know, it feels like we haven't done this in a couple of weeks. It's weird. It's like we missed one. Wait, Wait, we did. (laughs) Yes, we took a vacation. You quite literally. I, I did, and I'm happy to be back, and uh, I went to church today and immediately filled in for three people that called. <laughs> nice. You know, it was funny this morning My when I got home, actually around lunchtime when I got home, my wife was like, so how did church go? And I said, well, I, I actually literally was pulled in four different directions at one point. I said, I guess they're happy that I'm back. I'm not sure. I had people calling me that I'm like, why is this person calling me? I don't know. <laughs> it, me, so. it reminds me of the Scooby-Doo commercial where they go four directions and come back together and then run away. Literally, that that was me earlier today. So anyhow, if you've, if you've joined us this evening, thanks for hanging out with us. If you're listening on a podcast at a later time or on our YouTube channel, Uh, please feel free to click that like and subscribe button on the lower right-hand corner. That kind of helps us out. And uh, tonight, it's actually going to be Paul and I and our special guest. Uh, Mike had some family things come up at the last minute. And so he's like, whoops, I'm not going to make it. But um, that's okay. Last week, or not last week, last week we were off because of Thanksgiving. The week before, you guys met with uh, Simon and that was a great conversation. I, I was listening to it on the road, but but you guys had some great um, great discussion with him on basically civil civil actions and things that could potentially be happening in communities with churches and how to how to handle that. So we should have called that remaining civil during unrest. I think that would have worked well. <laughs> it it would have. So real quick before I, I'm, I'm just going to skate right past that, <laughs> all the puns, they don't get any better. I'm sorry, no. folks. <laughs> so if you, if you've just joined us, feel free to, to uh, post what church you're from, where you're listening mm-hmm. from. And also real quick, I just want to mention um, that uh, until the end of this month, which is, which is just a couple of days, we're running a, a special promotion on our devotionals. Um, those devotionals are actually ten dollars a piece. They're normally twelve ninety nine through Amazon. Um, I've had a few churches reach out to us and say, "Hey, can we get bulk bulk pricing or discount as as Christmas presents for our folks?" So, um, just a heads up: if you reach out to us through our website at churchsafetyguys.com, um, we are happy to to drop ship those to you. And there's still time to get them actually out before Christmas if if you um, if you're trying to give them out to your team or or to someone else. Um, but that that offer is still 
still out there and still available. So uh, if you're interested, feel free to reach out to us and, and we'll try and help you in that way as, as much as possible. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, medical and uh, different things with the uh, involving that with the church and just in general. Um, and we haven't had, this is actually the first time we've had a guest on that was specifically this medically um, taught or trained. So I'm kind of looking forward to it, but we're going to, uh, let me change this up and we'll bring uh, Ryan Burke in. Ryan is actually uh, with Tytech Medical. So thanks for joining us tonight, Ryan. I appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate the invite. So I will actually just, uh, I'll give you the opportunity to kind of introduce yourself and your background. Uh, we met, just for those listening, um, Ryan and I actually met at a uh, church safety conference that Dan Blevins was doing in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, Dan is with CV Ministries, and uh, he does a great podcast that we we endorse and listen to often. Uh, and in fact, Paul's coming up, going to be on one here coming up pretty soon, but, um, but definitely check out their website. So let me backtrack. I'll backtrack to Ryan. So Ryan, tell us, tell us about Tytech Medical and your, and your background. <laughs> so my, my background is in the fire and EMS world. Uh, I was a career firefighter medic. I uh, was also a tactical medic, uh, hazardous materials. Uh, then uh, I crossed over into the hospital world, the hospital emergency management world at one of the trauma centers in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, spent 10 years with them, and then I had the opportunity this year to come to work for Tytech Medical uh, as their Director of Emergency Preparedness. Uh, so I help support uh, Tytech uh, Medical's mission of educating, equipping, and empowering people to save lives. And uh, I do outreach with, you know, church, um, law enforcement community, fire and EMS community, professional sports, um, and, and try to, you know, have conversations with them and, you know, see what kind of uh, supplies they have, what kind of training they have, what they might need and, you know, how we can be of service and help. Cool. So when when you came to, to Dan's class, you were actually doing a, a Stop the Bleed course. Was Correct. that something, did Dan contact you about coming out or how did how did that get set up? So um, I actually uh, reached out to Dan. Um, I'm a uh, safety team leader for my church. And, and I saw there was kind of a need for uh, some stop the bleed training in, in churches uh, and, and equipping uh, churches with the appropriate uh, uh, items to stop severe life-threatening bleeding. You know, most churches have, you know, uh, first aid kits. You know, we can put Band-Aids on scratches. We have some, you know, uh, some medicine if somebody's got an upset stomach. But, you know, so somebody has a severe life-threatening bleed, we really don't have, a lot of churches really didn't have that type of equipment. So I started reaching out and doing some research and seeing, you know, how we can uh, help fill that void in this space. Cool. Okay. Makes sense. And yeah, I mean, you did, you did a great job on the stop the bleed class that I was in. It was, it was great to, to get a refresher and, and, um, and very knowledgeable. So for the, for the church, we kind of talked a little bit about it before, before we went live, but for the church that um, is looking for solid items to have in their first aid kit, like you just mentioned, band aids versus you know <laughs> appropriate trauma trauma gear. How can they sure. like? What can they? What are some things that they can look for and and maybe purchase that aren't crazy expensive or something simple that they can do uh, to be better prepared in that in that realm. Sure. So when you're talking severe life-threatening bleeding, you know, um, compression uh, is the way we're going to stop bleeding. And we can compress, you know, in the typical fashion of placing pressure, you know, on a wound. Um, you don't really need a lot of uh, muscle to stop bleeding. If you could take your finger and collapse a straw on a table, that's really 
the only amount of uh, pressure you need to physically uh, collapse a vessel and stop it from bleeding. But unfortunately, when you're talking of multiple injured, those type of things, it's hard to dedicate one person to put pressure on one other person when there's other people injured. So that's when we kind of cross over into the, you know, uh, adjuncts such as tourniquets. Uh, you know, tourniquets have, uh, were in vogue, weren't in vogue, you know, uh, they're good, they're bad. Uh, but, you know, truthfully, uh, the, the what people typically hear is, you know, you're choosing life or limb when you put on a tourniquet. That's actually just not so. That kind of came from... World War One, when we were still utilizing Civil War era tourniquets and leaving people in a trench for two or three days. Yes, um, if that's the circumstance, that limb south of the tourniquet is probably coming off. But we know now um, uh, through, you know, a lot of the uh, trauma uh, uh, cases that we've had, you know, with our you know recent uh, military conflicts and wars that uh, you can safely put on a modern era tourniquet for two hours with absolutely no ill effects. Uh, so tourniquets are safe and we can use tourniquets. The other thing uh, that you know we can do is we can pack a wound. Uh, so when you think of tourniquets, think of your extremities, your arms and your legs. Uh, when you think of packing a wound, think of your junctions, your groin, your armpits and your neck. And just to let you know, it's never appropriate to put a tourniquet on somebody's neck. That's not cool. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, but <laughs> that's the that's the liability disclaimer for the yeah. broadcast. <laughs> yes, yes. Don't do that. It does um, quiet the patient down. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> fair point. Fair point. But <laughs> but uh, you know those are the type of things that you know we're thinking about when we're talking about you know preparing for severe life threatening bleeding or those materials. You know, people also, and I think a lot of our, you know, military personnel listening in, law enforcement, fire and EMS will think, uh, you know, quick clot, uh, sea locks, the hemostatic gauze, which is gauze that's impregnated with a material that helps build a bigger, better, faster clot. And yes, you know, we have evidence that those things do work, but when you're talking $40 for one pack of one of those products versus a dollar or less for one roll of gauze, I would rather see a church have a hundred rolls of plain gauze versus two or three rolls of the high-end hemostatic agents. Uh, because we do have research now that shows, uh, indicates that, you know, it's, it's more about how you pack versus the high-end, you know, fancy stuff, if you will. Nice. Now, if you have an endless budget and you can afford <laughs> those items, by all means, stockpile away by all means but most of us don't have that luxury. <laughs> well it's funny i want to go back to the you mentioned the civil war era and some of the fallacies with tourniquets and it's funny yeah. because i just did and, and i mentioned mentioned to for those listening i mentioned to ryan before uh before this the show that um, I just recently kind of did an update at my church on tourniquets after going to his class. And what was funny is the the number one thing that people said to me was, well, now I have to, I have to loosen this up every, mm, you know, yeah. two minutes, right? I, I don't want the person to lose their arm. And I, you know, I stopped and I looked at him and I said, no, <laughs> you don't yeah. do that. And they're like, well, but he's probably going to lose his arm, right? If I tie it down. And, and I said, you know, I said, we, we live in Columbus, Ohio. There's probably 10 level three trauma center, you know, I'm like, yeah. but the, the reality is maybe, you know, maybe if you were eight hours from somewhere in the middle of nowhere, would you have different considerations? But for this type of thing, stop, you know, stop the bleed, stop it quickly, get it on there. Don't mess with it. Once you put it on, you know, leave it there until the person gets extra, extra medical help. So I know that there's a lot of, and, and the reason I say that is, is more of an encouragement to churches, just make sure when you do training that you address, you know, some of those things that float around out there, because even the, the, the most well intentioned individual trying to train on, on tourniquets might not have the, the most up-to-date information that, mm. You know, and years ago, I can remember much of the medical community taking things from the military after a conflict. Mm -hmm. And so there was, I remember there was a, a point in time when 
when I was an EMT where you, you, sh you weren't supposed to use a tourniquet. It was like a right. no, no. Yeah. And then it, it's like after the, I think it was after the um, battle of Mogadishu black Hawk down. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. No, it was after it was, it was actually after, uh, after Vietnam, but also after desert storm that mm -hmm. stuff started coming back and, and doctors started saying, look, this is actually a pretty, pretty sharp way of saving somebody's life. We need to do it, but you know, and train people, we just need to train them correctly in the, yeah. in the best practices of, of doing that. So, um, I'll th actually throw it over to Paul. You had something you wanted to well, there's so much here because <laughs> what you guys are talking about is so viable because it's so important because everybody has an opinion on tourniquets and it's so all over the place. It's unbelievable. Um, I mean, we've got data coming out of battlefields where people have had a tourniquet on for 11 hours and, and they've saved the limb. Now, at some point you add burping it into it. Most of us outside of a Paris attack, outside of a Sutherland Springs are never going to see a mass casualty incident where we can't get to one of those 10 trauma centers. Um, so, so odds are if a tourniquet gets applied within two hours, you're going to be in a medical facility that's going to take care of you. And what is it in Ryan, you can, you can speak to this, but I think it's a 96% likelihood. Now, if you're still alive, when they get you into a hospital, they start giving you transfusions and stitching you up that you'll survive. So the amazing thing is if we can keep that red Kool-Aid inside the torso, people yeah. seem to live. Yeah. And anyway, yeah. Well, I mean, unfortunately, um, you know, severe bleeding is the number one preventable cause of traumatic death. And this really came to light post Sandy Hook when Dr. Lenworth Jacobs started looking into um, how did these um, young ones die and could there have been something preventative that would have helped them survive? And is this something, are these things something that, um, you know, we could teach lay rescuers to intervene before that, that immediate responder before first responders show up? And that kind of gave birth to the Hartford consensus, which was uh, trauma surgeons, emergency physicians, first responder professionals coming together and trying to figure out how we can save lives in that immediate responder capacity. And thus the Stop the Bleed, the National Stop the Bleed curriculum was kind of born and uh, endorsed by the White House. I forget what year it was, but um, pretty much, uh, you know, American College of Surgeons has put out to trauma centers that, yes, you will put this out in the community if you want to be accredited, you know, essentially. And, you know, fire departments, law enforcement agencies have adopted this. And the beauty to the National Stop the Bleed curriculum is that if you are a commissioned police officer, an EMT, emergency medical responder, paramedic, doc, nurse, uh, even ski patrol. Um, if you take this course, you can then teach this course to your church, to your community. So it is very sustainable and also a way the church can outreach to the community by posting these courses in house. Yeah. So if you're listening at home, that's worth backing up later and listening to again. That's good stuff. Now, one of the one of the folks listening asked a, a, a great question. Um, they just messaged it in and it says, can you all address pediatric tourniquets or using like using a tourniquet on a child? What what are your thoughts with that, Ryan? So you can use a, uh, a tourniquet on a child just like you would use them on an adult. Um, uh, I've had this question many times, uh, specifically referencing the cat tourniquet, uh, which is probably the most popular tourniquet on the market today. Uh, there are other ones out there on the market, but uh, just as a side note, if you are going to purchase a kit or a just tourniquet standalone, make sure what you're purchasing is the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care recommended product there's probably seven or eight tourniquets that are recommended by them. That's the committee that um, advises our men and women in uniform, what they will use on the battlefield. Um, they also provide recommendations for um, uh, hemostatic agents and bleeding control adjuncts like that. So take a look into that. For things that they don't have recommendations for, there's research out there. If you can't find the answer, uh, reach out to me, I'll help you find the answer. But going back to the original question, 
you have to have a kind of a really small, very, very, very small uh, extremity uh, for a cat tourniquet not to work on it. And the beauty of, um, you know, having such a small extremity, if you need to, and a cat tourniquet won't work, if it won't work, um, pressure works very, very well on such a small extremity. But yes, um, if you can get uh, a tourniquet around an extremity, probably, you know, a little bit smaller than my wrist would probably be the smallest uh, you could go with like a cat turn. Nice. Cool. So, as an aside to follow that really quickly, I work with a lot of officers who have canines and I'm, I'm mm. really, I'm really excited that they are starting to go. Um, so I've got tourniquets for me and for you and for him, but what about my dog? So <laughs> no. talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the most popular tourniquets uh, that's out there for uh, canines and a lot of canine officers use it, is called the SWAT tourniquet. Mm -hmm. And that's roughly, uh, you know, I think it's three or four inch wide, roughly, you know, uh, three foot, four foot. Yep, there you go. Yep. Long uh, rubber band essentially is what it is. Uh, but it works very well for odd shaped limbs uh, like a canine. Uh, and we have a canine handler pouch for law enforcement officers, for hunters because you know you know dog out in the wood gets injured you know you don't want your your buddy to you know to, to have an, a poor outcome or you know if your dog's just the home's defender you know you don't want your you know your protector of the house to get injured and not be able to take care of him so uh, we do have a canine handler pouch and it does come with that tourniquet as well as a cat tourniquet i know a dog pouch with a cat tourniquet haha -ha. but uh <laughs> we gotta take care of the humans too nice no, that's a, that's actually a great, that's a great idea. And I appreciate Paul bringing it up too, yeah. because I know uh, that's not something I would have thought, but then I don't have pets at home. I don't have animals at home. So it's kind of nice to know. I know you can do CPR on an animal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but in, in kind of going back, I want to go back real quick to the, the, um, the regulation that you mentioned for the, the tourniquets oh. and just making sure, just making sure that it's certified and that it's, it's appropriate. Cause they're like, I, I know you and I talked about it in, in Dayton, but there are a lot of companies on eBay that are just selling like knockoffs. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and one of the things I know I've, I've found with some of those is that even just in, in training or testing just to try and tighten it down like pieces go flying and parts go yeah, yeah. so yeah. um where if if somebody was interested in and i will get it posted back up for some reason i can't post with comments tonight something's up with the with our software but um if someone was interested in looking up and making sure that that tourniquet was certified, is there a website that they could go to? Um, um, there, there's a couple of different websites that they can go to. They can uh, go to TyTech Medical's uh, uh, training and education page, and uh, we have that information up there. Um, they can also Google uh, Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care Tourniquet recommendations because uh, that that committee uh, only provides recommendations uh, so or they can put t triple c t c c c uh, tourniquet recommendations um, they do look at uh, new tourniquets and stuff like that there are a few tourniquets on the market that are very good tourniquets they're not recommended yet and the only reason they're not recommended yet i believe is probably because they didn't have enough data uh, to provide that recommendation, but th it is updated, I believe, on, at least on an annual basis. Okay, that makes right. sense. Yeah, that's one of the coolest things that war is a terrible thing, and we touched on this yeah. earlier, but every time we have a war, medical science jumps forward. Anesthesia, yeah. all these things. We've, we've got people now, I just listened to an interview on a podcast where a guy We've got guys going back into combat that are missing part of a leg, like a significant part of a leg or more. Mm -hmm. And they, they're saved on the battlefield. We've got agents that are that are uh, different things that are taking care of them and stabilizing them. We get them out of the country sometimes after 8, 10, 12 hours. 
and they're not only recovering and living a full life some of them are actually qualifying and going back into combat mm. and you know for for all of the atrocities and horrors of war it it makes things like what you do ryan possible that's absolutely i mean it's it's incredible what we've learned and it's kind of interesting since i've, I've been a medic now for, for 20 years um and some of the stuff that i was taught you know going through medic school uh, we learn now through some of the conflicts that, that was not the right thing to be doing. You know, at one point in time, if you had somebody that was bleeding, you know, we would blow as much uh, normal saline through their system as possible to raise to give the get a blood pressure on them. If you didn't walk into the ER with a blood pressure of at least a, you know, a hundred, uh, you weren't a respectable medic. And unfortunately, we learned we were floating around like. Kool-Aid uh, and Kool-Aid doesn't carry oxygen, doesn't carry nutrients. So we've kind of gone mm -hmm. to this thing called permissive hypotension. You know, if they're conscious and they got a palpable pulse, you know, don't turn their blood into Kool-Aid, which now that you think about it kind of makes sense. But um, yeah, we've learned tremendous amount of things uh, through what's going on over in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you remember? I'm just kind of curious, Ryan. Do you remember using mass trousers at all yep. back in the day? <laughs> yeah. Oh, so yeah. One of the one of the first calls that I ever went on was on was with two medics, and one of them was a, a Vietnam veteran that had served as a as a Vietnam mm -hmm. medic, and uh, and he ended up we ended up life flighting, having to life flight the the guy because he was this guy was on July third, I think. This was a long time ago, but he was he was making fireworks and he was mixing black powder and mm. in a coffee can with a, a, a wooden spoon. And he went like this to try and break up some of the chunks of black powder. And the next thing he he remembered, he was waking up in a trauma center in Boston. Wow. Um, but what had happened was he had. Mm. Um, Instantly, he blew out the windows of his house. His house went to a second alarm status instantly from that. And so the fire department responded. They got there and they said, um, look, you know, there's nobody here. There's nothing going on. It's a house fire. And uh, when they started laying the, the first lines, the, uh, the owner came out of the house on fire and collapsed on the front porch and they, wow. they were able to put the fire out. And so instantly, so we were, we were already against time at that point, but yeah. the fire chief instantly said, you know, we need whatever you can send us medically um, because their rescue squad at that point was, was really just uh, first responder kind of like the, the basic status. Yeah. And so I was on this, this ambulance, we were responding to them and uh, we, we couldn't get it because of where we were, we couldn't get approval for life flight. Um, we still got life flight. We called them directly and said, mm -hmm. we need you with this. And yeah. the other thing was even back then, and this was the, the 90s, um, everybody was saying, you know, don't use mass trousers. Don't that's a big, big no, no. And uh, I remember getting off the ambulance and in the Vietnam vet that was there was like go get the mass trousers right now <laughs> and i'm yeah. like okay you're in you know you're in charge but uh we and we got i remember we got reamed over the coals big time mm. you know from medical medical direction later yeah. but we kind of played it off as you know what we were in the middle of nowhere literally um and there was no communication we i mean we couldn't even use our uhf radios on like the trucks and stuff that's how far wow. out we were and we saved the guy's life. I mean, he he ended up having a couple fingers, um, you know, a few digits less than because they couldn't. Yeah, they couldn't yeah. sew this back on. But um, to me, it was it it really opened my eyes. And and the connection that I'm just trying to make here with it is, it opened my eyes to the point of saying, assess the situation and and use what you need to use at this point at this at this time. Yeah. And I know a, a lot of times we talk to churches that are like, hey, I, I want a first aid kit and this first aid kit has everything, everything we need in it and we're good and that's it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the, the best invested time is actually to sit down and go through that kit and realize that, you know, a generic 30 piece kit isn't really going to address what 
you know, what we see as churches mm -hmm. most of the time. And it's certainly not going to go past to the point of, you know, having, you know, 800, 1200 people in your building when you have a, a, a traumatic event or some, some type of big situation. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that story brings up a couple of great points. Um, you know, first point being is, you know, these things are not just needed in the church or your place of work. These things are needed in the home because, you know, we have to admit us guys, we do dumb stuff and we injure ourselves. Uh, so, you know, these things are needed in the home as well. Uh, but the other point is, is that you brought up, uh, I believe it was a 2018 uh, research study. You know, the U.S. has some of the best pre-hospital care anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And the average, or excuse me, the median uh, time uh, for a call to actual on-scene arrival is about six minutes. Mm -hmm. And if you get the right wound, you can bleed to death easily in three to four minutes. So let sure. that marinate for a minute. While that's marinating, if you live in a rural community, your you know median time is uh, about 13 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, on that research okay. study. Again, that was back in 2018, but I'm sure we've not gotten a whole lot better since then. Um, but uh, you know, plenty of time for somebody to uh, die of, of severe bleeding uh, if we don't have those immediate responders and the right equipment available. Sure. And, and in my situation, I mean, like I said, that was in the 90s, but it, it took us at least 40 minutes to get an ambulance to mm -hmm. where wow. this house was. And at that point, yeah, we were like, OK, it's going to take us another 40 minutes to get out of here to like a level one trauma center. This guy mm -hmm. needs to be flown either to Dartmouth because I, I used to live in New, uh, New Hampshire. So at that point, we're like, okay, this guy either needs to go to Boston or he needs to go up to Dartmouth um, uh, College Hospital. Mm -hmm. And so um, Dartmouth actually was the one that they have a, a Dart uh, life flight, basically. And they sent it out and they're like, look, we're just going to get him back. I mean, literally where we were, we were still putting stuff back in the truck and he was already at the hospital. Wow. So, I mean, from that standpoint, it was definitely the right call, regardless of, you know, of of misusing proper protocol in that moment. Yeah. Um, but you, you're you absolutely right with, I mean, this the stuff that we've had, even in our own home, a lot of times, you know, we don't think about stuff like that happening to us, like the value of having a tourniquet. Well, if you're, you know, around power tools and you're out in your garage, maybe yep. that's not a bad idea. <laughs> not a bad idea at all. You know, so and even even when I'm uh, vacationing in Florida in the summertime and stuff like that, in my little beach bag that has all the other supplies, <laughs> uh, you know, I have tourniquets in there. I have uh, compressed gauze in there uh, because you never know what's going to what's going to happen. So. Cool. You know, you were talking about how quickly someone can bleed out. Two two quick things on that about why being a what did you call it an instant responder like immediate responder immediate responder. So um, the I was on a ride along one night and we actually responded to a, the, a call in of an active shooter mm. and uh, turns out it was a, a domestic that went south and uh, and an, an elderly lady shot her husband in the arm. Oh, wow. And so he had a he had a GSW to his left arm right here in the forearm. And uh, so we get there and, and you have to forgive me. I've trained for a long time. And in my brain and you guys have done this. I haven't done this yet. I was like, "Ooh, achievement unlocked. I will put a tourniquet on someone. who." <laughs> and the officer beat me to it because I'm like, you know, I've called him by his last name. He has a GSW to his left arm. He needs a tourniquet. And so he's like, cover me and, and look for the shooter. I'm going to put the tourniquet on. And, and he lived, he mm -hmm. probably lost between a liter and two liters of blood. Wow. And he had walked about 70 feet. Um, were it not for the tourniquet applied by that officer, this guy at about 80 years old would be with Jesus. He would have died. Oh. And, and yeah. But he was, yeah, you know, and then he was released within 24 hours and wow. uh, no broken bones. And uh, it was a miracle. I mean, uh, that, that she didn't break anything when she shot him because of where she hit him. And then two, um, I was at a wreck about 15 years ago. There were seven people in two cars that met in the middle of the road. And there were two life flights, five ambulances, and two fatalities. Two people died before it was over. 
Um, I was there. My wife's a nurse. I'm be doing big dumb stuff. She's putting in IVs. She's helping triage. So I'm doing the big and dumb, and she's doing the 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 trained smart stuff. And they ran out of plasma between two helos and five wow. ambulances. So to your point, being able to to help people and keep the red Kool Aid inside. Um, oddly enough, we run on that. And if it yeah. stopped running, we were in trouble. And I mean, yeah. I say that to be funny, but the Paris attack of the theater, I have read, I don't know if it's true. I haven't talked to anybody that was there, but I have read that many of the people that died actually died at the hospital because there weren't enough doctors and nurses, people medically qualified to mm. stop the bleeding. Yeah. And when you think about things like that, God forbid we have a mass casualty event that we're at, we need enough tourniquets, chest seals, uh, gauze, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. I mean, you know, we have to keep the blood in the tank. We, ha we have to keep it because it does so much. You know, our, our, our metabolism creates heat within our bodies. And, and to that point, um, you know, uh, hypothermia is an absolute 100% no questions asked pillar of trauma patients. So, you know, when you're thinking of the order of doing things, once you stop that bleed, the next immediate thing you should be thinking about is how to keep them warm. And it doesn't matter whether it's winter, summer, you can absolutely go hypothermic. Uh, a trauma patient can become hypothermic sitting on Miami Beach in the summertime. It's absolutely possible. There you go. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to remember what year the research study happened. I think it was a few years ago um, where I think they looked at about 700 normal patients, not trauma, you know, exsanguination patients um, that uh, had a core body temperature drop down to 89.5 degrees. And I believe it was only 25 or 20 percent of those people died. But then they looked at 70 uh, bleeding patients, trauma patients that had had severe bleeding. Um, and uh, all 70 of those patients had dropped a body temperature down to 89.5 degrees. And 100, 100 percent of those patients died. Huh. So wow. hypothermia is an absolute killer of trauma patient we have copy to make that. sure people address that copy that and that's that's actually i think you mentioned that in the class that i did did with you as well to me yeah. that's just amazing that it's like okay we we have to treat for shock and and we have to regulate the body temperature because that can that can be the difference because your body's shutting down between you know the amount of blood you lost and and really survival even after the fact. So. Yeah, yeah, it, it's twofold. It's, you know, your body's giving off heat to the environment uh, if the environment is less than 98.6 degrees. And then as you lose blood, you're not able to have that metabolism to create your own heat. So it's it's a twofold killer. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, creates a whole bunch of other cascading effects um, that, you know, we don't sure. really want to get into tonight, but um, <laughs> we, we we have to keep people, we have to keep them warm. And, and a, a naked, dry patient is better than a clothed, wet patient because water transfers heat uh, 32 times faster. Uh, so, wow. wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Heck, heck of a conductor. Yes, it is. Hmm. Absolutely. Well, we're going to go, we'll go ahead and take a sponsor break. Uh, we okay. kind of went past that time, but that's okay. Right. Great, great. No, it's not your fault. Great conversation. No, and I, I know that, uh, I know that people will benefit from hearing. So we're going to, um, we're, we're going to do a quick sponsor break. And then when we come back, we're actually going to um, play a video for you on how to stop severe bleeding. And it was actually done by Ty Tech Medical. Um, and Ryan actually sent it to me. So uh, it's a it's a great quick video, but I will actually bring that in and play it for you guys, so you'll have um, have the ability to watch that as well. So stay stay with us, and we'll be back in just a second. With over fifty years of experience with religious and nonprofit organizations, Thomas Alexander Insurance and Associates understands that your congregation is different from a traditional business. We're here to fulfill your needs, coming to you while creating a personal plan for your budget and size. 
from your local community to around the globe. We are advocates for you. Thomas Alexander Insurance and Associates, your partner in service. The worst has happened. Evil has invaded the sanctuary. Lives were ended, and the life of every surviving member of your church has changed forever. There will be funerals to attend. The grieving and the counseling will go on for years to come. You may even lose church members, especially if your pastor was killed during the attack. But what if I told you that all of this could have been prevented with the proper training? That your church could learn how to secure its campus and how to see the signs of an attack before it happens. At Shield Force International, we will teach you the skills you need to protect your church, to protect your children, to mitigate and even eliminate would-be threats to your church body all before it happens. We can no longer pretend that evil doesn't exist or that churches aren't targets. Attacks against churches and pastors are on the rise. Call or visit us online for a free consultation. The Church Safety Guys is a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping equip, train, and disciple church safety and security teams. We are about all things church safety and security, which starts with a ministry mindset and a servant's heart. We are protectors, guardians, ambassadors, and shepherds. We help church and place of worship safety and security teams all over the United States through our broadcasts, online communities, conferences, trainings, resources, and products. Help us reach more churches in impactful ways by considering becoming a monthly ministry partner. $2, $5, $20 a month will help us continue to provide these resources. most common causes of preventable death after a traumatic injury is uncontrolled severe bleeding. I'm Dustin Calhoun, an emergency and EMS physician and EMS medical director in Southwest Ohio. I've seen firsthand that educating, equipping, and empowering people to recognize and stop severe bleeding saves lives. Please join me and TyTech Medical for this introduction or refresher on bleeding control. When we discuss severe bleeding, many people think of assaults and violence. However, it's more likely that you'll need to apply this training in your day-to-day activities. Work-related injuries, injuries in your home, or even motor vehicle crashes are places where this training can be very applicable. Learning how to identify bleeding and effectively rendering aid to stop the bleed after a traumatic injury can save lives. Before we begin, remember, as an immediate responder rendering aid to an injured person, your safety is paramount. If you get injured, you're adding to the problem, not the solution. These situations can be overwhelming. You need an easy way to remember basic principles of what to do when faced with severe bleeding emergencies. I like the ABCs, alert, bleeding, and compression. A stands for alert, call for help. Don't ever assume that someone else has alerted first responders. It's up to you to either call or clearly direct someone else to call for help. Be as clear as possible regarding your location. This is especially important if calling from a cell phone, since it's very possible that first responders can't see your location. Letting the dispatcher know your precise location will assist getting responders to the patient faster and save precious time when every second counts. B stands for bleeding. Look for the site of life-threatening bleeding, as the location of the bleeding will guide which method you choose to control it. If necessary, open or remove clothing so that you can see the wound. Don't forget areas that are in contact with the ground. 
Once the wound is located, quickly determine if the bleeding truly is life-threatening. Examples of life-threatening bleeding include blood that's spurting out of the wound, blood that won't stop coming out of the wound, blood that's pooling on the ground, bandages or clothing that are soaked with blood, loss of all or part of an arm or leg, or bleeding in a patient that's now confused or unconscious. Make a quick and decisive decision since every second counts. Keeping blood inside the body not only delivers oxygen and nutrients throughout the body, but helps the body heal itself through clotting and maintaining body temperature to prevent hypothermia. C stands for compress. Apply pressure to stop the bleeding. To stop bleeding quickly, we need to stop the flow. We do this by applying pressure. Simple, direct pressure with a gloved finger is usually highly effective. At times, other techniques will be appropriate, and these include tourniquets and wound packing. Later, we'll teach you how to perform all three of these techniques, but now let's start by identifying how bleeding in different parts of the body require different compression methods. When it comes to bleeding, there are three zones of the body, the extremities, the junctions, and the torso. The extremities include arms and legs, Bleeding from extremities can usually be controlled through direct pressure to the wound or through the use of a tourniquet placed between the wound and the torso. Junctions include the neck, shoulders, armpits, groin, and buttock. Since a tourniquet cannot be applied appropriately to these wounds, and it's never appropriate to apply a tourniquet to someone's neck, management of these wounds include direct pressure and wound packing. The torso includes the chest, abdomen, and back, and is associated mostly with internal bleeding. Unfortunately, without in-depth training, this kind of bleeding cannot be controlled outside of the hospital. The most important steps you can take is to ensure the first responders are on the way, help prevent hypothermia, and identify the patient to first responders once they arrive. If you were trained and the wound is appropriate, it may be reasonable to use a chest seal if you have one available but this is not a bleeding control technique. We'll talk more about that later. To get started, you should always protect yourself by first putting on medical gloves. Most quality public access bleeding control kits will include these. Many public places are adding bleeding control stations. If you choose to render aid and do not have gloves available, be sure to wash your hands or use hand sanitizer as soon as possible and let first responders know of your exposure so that you can be assessed and provided with guidance. So how do you perform the compression methods we've mentioned? Let's start with direct pressure. Rapidly applying direct pressure to a severely bleeding wound can control external bleeding from just about anywhere on the body. Firmly applied gloved hands placed directly onto the bleeding vessel can control bleeding from even the largest blood vessels. You don't need any sort of special supplies, but if you happen to have cloth or gauze available, you can use it to help apply pressure. But it's very important that you keep that pressure well aimed directly over the bleeding site. Controlling the bleeding is more important than sterility at this point. Do not release pressure to see how well it's working. Keep applying firm pressure until relieved by medical providers. Understand that all of the methods discussed may cause the injured person pain, but it is necessary to control the bleeding to preserve life. Talk to the patient, be reassuring, and most of all, be calm. Let's talk tourniquets. You may have heard that if you choose to use a tourniquet, it's a choice between life or limb, that you may save a life, but the limb below the tourniquet will be lost. That's just not the case. Modern tourniquets can be safely applied for up to two hours with little or no negative effects. I strongly encourage you to use a tourniquet that has been recommended by the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care as they determine the products used by our men and women in uniform. Today, we'll be using the Combat Application Tourniquet. It's important to note that if you don't have a tourniquet immediately available when you need one, apply direct pressure, as we just described, until one becomes available. 
start the tourniquet application by simply opening up the band. If you need to, you can completely open the band in order to thread the tourniquet around the limb. Alternatively, you can simply place the limb inside the loop of the tourniquet, as you see me doing here. The next step is to get the tourniquet as tight as you possibly can. We're gonna do this by fully opening up the band and then pulling. And we here, we want to pull as tightly as we can. We wanna take every bit of slack that we can out of that tourniquet and get it as snug to the limb as we can. We'll then adhere the self-adhering band as far around the tourniquet as we possibly can, using up as much of that self-adhering band as possible. From there, I'm gonna to begin to stop the bleed. And I'm gonna do that by tightening the tourniquet using the windlass rod. If you have secured the band as tightly as you can, it will usually only take between two and five turns of the windlass rod to get complete control of bleeding. Here, I'm gonna to turn twice. Once you have seen the bleeding from your wound stop, you're gonna secure the windlass within the windlass clip on the tourniquet. At that point, take any remaining tail of the tourniquet and place it through that windlass securing clip and then secure the tail and the windlass rod using the securing strap across the clip. As a last step, if you have something to write with, place the time that you applied the tourniquet on this strap. If you don't have anything to write on the tourniquet with, it's important to note the approximate time that the tourniquet was applied and relay that to first responders when they take over patient care. So why is it so important to make the tourniquet so tight? If you do not tighten the tourniquet as much as possible, you may stop the veins from continuing to bleed, but the arteries, because they're thicker and under higher pressure, may continue to bleed. To prevent this, we should tighten the tourniquet a bit more. There, now we've stopped the bleed. One topic related to tourniquets about which you may hear some debate is exactly where on the limb the tourniquet should be placed. Many people will instruct you to place it approximately two to three inches above the actual wound. Alternatively, and often in the military or law enforcement arena, you will hear it taught high and tight, meaning that you place the tourniquet as far up the limb as you possibly can. There are reasons for both, and as we mentioned, it is safe for a modern tourniquet to be on a limb appropriately applied for approximately two hours without any negative consequences. For that reason, either of these positionings is reasonable. It's also important to avoid joints. Never put a tourniquet directly over a joint. It's not going to hurt the joint, but because of the specific anatomy of our body's joints, it will not be able to control bleeding as efficiently. If you apply the tourniquet, and have made it as tight as possible, and the bleeding is still not controlled, apply a second tourniquet if one is available. Apply it right next to the first tourniquet and tighten it just as we did with the first one. Two tourniquets will occasionally be required to stop bleeding, especially on a large leg or thigh. If a second tourniquet is not available, apply pressure to the wound as we discussed previously. Once a tourniquet has been applied, leave it on. Some of you may have been trained to loosen it every so often. Do not loosen a tourniquet. Paramedics or physicians will remove the tourniquet if necessary when appropriate. By loosening it, you can lose precious blood, which is bad for the patient. It's important to note that it is possible for a person to have an amputation or a partial amputation of a limb with little or no bleeding. You should still place a tourniquet on the limb. Without it, at some point, the blood vessels will relax and life-threatening bleeding will occur. If you're going to practice, and we definitely recommend that you do, do not use a tourniquet that you plan to use in real life. Designate a specific tourniquet for training. Additionally, we strongly encourage you to contact your local hospital, trauma center, or fire department and take a Stop the Bleed course. They'll only take about an hour and a half of your time, and it will increase your capability and confidence to save a life. Now, let's go over the steps for packing a junctional wound with gauze or even clean cloth. First, you have to locate the wound. We've done this previously. 
open the clothing, tear away clothing, remove debris, wipe away blood. Do what you need to be able to do to see down in the wound to try to find where the blood is coming from. You may have to wipe away some of the larger, looser blood clots or some of the pooled blood, but you want to see where the source of bleeding is coming from. Looking into the wound, you can often find that single or maybe two bleeding sources, but even the largest wounds rarely have more than one or two sources of most active bleeding. From there, we want to begin packing the wound. Now, for demonstration purposes, we're gonna use Titex Easy Gauze. It does have some really nice aspects in that once it's open, the gauze itself is actually in an inner package. And that inner package can help keep that gauze clean as you're packing the wound. There's a simple tab that allows you easy access while maintaining the packaging. Now, as we mentioned earlier, sterility is not our primary priority here. The most important thing here is stopping the bleeding. So if I were to drop this on the ground, or if I were having to use an alternative, like a tie or a handkerchief or um, a scarf, I would still do that because we can treat those things later. Bleeding is an immediate life threat. In this case, we have that nice inner packaging that's gonna keep this nice and clean for us as we begin to control the bleeding. So here, I've wiped away what I can. I've identified the most significant sources of bleeding. And now I'm gonna apply my packing material directly to that most significant source of bleeding. Now, once I've applied this there and I've put pressure, my goal is to maintain continuous pressure on that source of bleeding throughout this process while simply adding more material into the wound. And I'm gonna do that using a two-handed process here. I will take, add a little bit of gauze and then hold pressure. And I'll continue doing that, adding small amounts of gauze into the wound, trying to fill the entire wound cavity, if at all possible, while making sure to maintain pressure in that one spot. Now, it's important that as I do this, I maintain my own safety. There can be sharp objects inside wounds. They can be fragments of the item that made the wound, or even bone shards can be very sharp and can certainly cut through exam gloves. So as we're doing this, it's very important to keep your safety as a priority. I'll continue packing, being careful for my safety of any sharp objects in the wound. And then once I have reached a point where I can't get any more wound packing into the wound, I'm gonna move on to the next step, which is to maintain that pressure. Now, in some instances, you may have a situation where you run out of packing material before you run out of wound. If that's the case, the best option is to find some other packing material. However, if I run out of wound before I run out of packing material, I'm going to take the remainder of my packing material and place it like a bolster directly on top of the bleeding source and continue placing pressure here. I want a minimum of three to five minutes holding pressure on that wound. In order to do this in many situations, we may want to place a pressure dressing. In this case, we're going to use Titex trauma bandage in order to place that pressure. Before I do so though, I wanna get a little bit more of a bolster here. The more bolster I can put, the more directly the pressure I'm going to have from my, my pressure dressing going straight into the wound. I'm gonna use here the ubiquitous water bottle directly on top of my wound. Now I'm gonna to have to move the limb around here a little bit because it doesn't weigh very much like a human body actually does. I'll take my trauma dressing. Again, the entire time I'm maintaining pressure directly over that wound. And then I slowly wrap very carefully, making sure to maintain that pressure the entire time all the way around, using as much of the elastic property as possible. With Titex dressing here, every so often there's a little bit of Velcro so that if I accidentally let go, this doesn't unwind itself. Once I've used all of the dressing, I'm gonna use the plastic clips on the end to secure it in place. And then I'm gonna continue my three to five minutes of pressure. What if a person has multiple wounds? Which wound should you address first? People commonly think that you try to identify the more severe bleed or whichever is closest to the heart. The simple answer is the wound that you should address first is the wound that you can use a tourniquet for. Then you should address other wounds that you have to pack or hold continuous pressure. 
It's much better to invest 30 seconds of bleeding while you place a tourniquet than it is to invest several minutes while you invest time packing a wound or commit yourself to holding continuous pressure. This does not mean that you have to ignore the other wounds while you place the tourniquet. If you can, use your knee to apply pressure to the second wound while you tend to the first. You may have heard of products called hemostatic gauze. This is gauze that's been impregnated with a material designed to help the body build a quicker, better clot. There is evidence that supports these products and that they can have some benefit in certain circumstances. At times, I've definitely recommended these items be available in hemorrhage control kits for organizations such as military units or SWAT teams or at times certain first responder applications. However, there is also plenty of evidence that the most important aspect of hemorrhage control is technique, well-aimed direct pressure, Good deep wound packing with maintained good pressure using a pressure dressing is the key to hemorrhage control and saving a life. Additionally, based on the significant price difference between hemostatic gauzes and standard gauzes, I feel it's much more beneficial for someone to be able to place 10, 20, or even 100 rolls of simple gauze in numerous locations throughout their premises as opposed to a few rolls of hemostatic gauze in a few places. If you do elect to use hemostatic gauze for your applications, I would strongly recommend, as we did with tourniquets, that you use a hemostatic gauze recommended and approved by the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care. Some bleeding control kits may contain something called a chest seal. One of the most important things to remember about a chest seal is it is not a bleeding control device. Chest seals are intended to address certain kinds of very specific injuries to the torso that interfere with our body's ability to breathe. Their purpose is to reestablish the normal breathing mechanism in that particular kind of injury. But again, it has no purpose and no intent to attempt to stop bleeding. These are somewhat of a complicated device, as are the pathophysiology that leads to their need. For that reason, it's important that if you're gonna use a chest seal, that you get extensive additional training in how to use these. And in most circumstances, these are probably best left to trained medical personnel. It's important to also remember that there are some circumstances where placing a chest seal on a wounded person could actually lead to worsening of their condition. So if a chest seal is placed, that patient must be monitored continuously. And if their condition begins to worsen, that chest seal should be immediately removed. Now, let's discuss hypothermia. As mentioned earlier, hypothermia is a killer of trauma patients and must be addressed early. You might associate hypothermia with the cold of winter, but hypothermia is a trauma patient's worst nightmare, and it can happen any time of the year, including in the heat of summer. In general, a person loses about 10% of their ability to create a blood clot and stop their own bleeding for every degree Celsius below normal body temperature. So, a person who has dropped two degrees of body temperature has actually lost 20% of their ability to produce a clot, which is compounded by the bleeding itself. So once the bleeding has been controlled, always act to prevent the patient from becoming hypothermic. If possible, keep the patient out of the elements. A disrobed patient who is dry is much safer than a clothed patient who is wet because water transfers heat about 32 times faster than air. Cover the patient with dry clothing or a blanket or even an emergency blanket as you see here. And that's it. Just remember the ABCs. Alert, call for help. Bleeding, find the injury. Compress, apply pressure to stop further blood loss by applying direct pressure, applying a tourniquet or packing a wound. Reach out to your local hospital or trauma center or fire department and inquire about taking a stop the bleed course. Hands-on practice is essential to ensure your ability to respond when needed. Additionally, TITEC Medical offers resources to help educate, equip, and empower you to stop the bleed and save a life. Thank you very much for joining me today to learn more about how you can be an immediate responder and save a life from life-threatening bleeding. Let me unmute myself there and everyone else. <laughs> All right, so 
let me oh, there we go all right so the the joys of switching from a youtube video <laughs> back to <laughs> back to live broadcast so anyhow uh we just wanted to play that with you and if if you're listening online this is a um we're the church safety guys sunday night broadcast we're back and we were just actually playing a uh, a video that uh, was provided to us by Ty Tech Medical, and it's really a helpful video. Um, I, it's been a long time since I've seen one, so I appreciate Ryan you sharing it with us because it's been a long time since I've seen one that was that concise to say, you know, this is well, what. <laughs> well, again, you know, with our our, our primary mission being educating, uh, we saw during the COVID times that people were not being able to go to Stop the Bleed classes and host Stop the Bleed classes. So we wanted to figure out a way that, you know, we could provide some level of education and training on how to stop the bleed, uh, you know, in that in that safe manner. Sure. So if you're if you're listening at home or or watching the broadcast or you're watching it through the week, um, if you're interested in that a copy of that YouTube video. It is just a YouTube video. Um, Ty Tech was gracious enough to, to put that online. Um, so I will go ahead and post a, a link to it um, when we share the broadcast. And if you're interested or if you're, you want to share that with your team and you can't find it, just let me know, you know, shoot us an email at, at uh, churchsafetyguys.com and uh, we will respond back and send you that link so you can play it uh, play it for your team. Um, definitely some great topics, some, some great discussion. Uh, I wish that we had another hour or two <laughs> Absolutely. to spend with you. Cause I'm sure I would love to, to dive more into even your, your, uh, background as, as being involved with church safety yourself. Cause I'm sure you've got some pretty fun, fun and crazy stories. Um, like most of us do but um on that note uh we will if if you're agreeable to it we will have you back on if uh, if paul hasn't scared you off too much <laughs> no no but, absolutely happy to come back well we, we appreciate it so usually what we'll do we'll go ahead and um paul i'm going to actually ask you to close in prayer tonight and then um we will wrap up the show so whenever you're ready sir Awesome. Well, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, that was eye-opening and really, really good stuff. I think, I hope that this has whetted the appetites of, of people to want to go further and deeper because as I was listening to that video, there were things that I had wondered about that I was like, oh, you know, I'm like sitting here, you know, mentally taking notes going interesting. So thank you for coming on and we will definitely have to have you back. Thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. All right, let's pray out. Sure. Sure. Dearly Father, Lord God, I thank you for these men. I thank you for the opportunity to to serve alongside the church safety guys and to to minister and to try to raise awareness, Lord God. And it's opportunities like these that we wouldn't see them outside of this structure. And Lord God, there are, there are people that will benefit from this because they will become aware of things that they didn't know. I ask that you'd help it to reach the right ears, that it would go that it would go into the right churches, it would go into the right environments, and people would realize that they need more than a first aid kit. They need more than one tourniquet. They need more than one little medical bag. They need to take it to the next level. And knowledge is power. Even an improvised uh, bandage is with, with knowledge is better than the right tools and no knowledge. So, Lord God, I thank you for Ryan, for his mission. I ask that you would bless him, that you would guide him. We live tonight up to you in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Great. All right. So again, just to wrap up real quick, if you are listening on uh, Spotify or Apple podcast, uh, be sure to, to subscribe and like the channel for us. And then also if you're, if you're watching on YouTube at a later time, just hit the like and subscribe. And uh, one of the things that I did want to mention real quick coming up um, this week, this Tuesday, we actually have uh, what we call Giving Tuesday. And so if you're if you're considering giving to a nonprofit or if you're um, thinking about blessing an, a ministry, uh, please consider the Church Safety Guys. Um, we have links on our website so that you can do that and, and uh, record it uh, as a charitable organization in Ohio. And uh, that helps us because what we do is uh, we're, we're a nonprofit organization and we uh, seek to equip, train, and disciple churches. And so we give out from 
you know, copies of, of uh, devotionals and curriculum for discipleship to uh, trying to bring speakers, great speakers to you for training and, and uh, to providing equipment. Um, that's our goal and that's our ministry. So please consider uh, donating if it's on your heart um, because that helps us kind of keep the lights on and, and uh, keeps Paul with his, his funny banter and, and puns never ending in the background. So Once if you donate this year, I promise I will not sing on an episode in 2021. So there's that. <laughs> if you donate on wow. Tuesday, there will be no singing. So where's, where's my wallet? <laughs> I'm going I'm gonna to do that. But seriously, um, through the rest, consider that prayerfully consider that through the rest of the year. Again, if you, if you'd like a copy of our devotional, we are doing discounts on that. So please reach out to us and we can help you uh, provide uh, provide that, and oftentimes we've actually sent them out at, at just our cost uh, to churches to try and just help them with a structure to to um, just build discipleship, build engagement, build uh, longevity. We all know church safety is is a is a hard, time consuming ministry, and so it's nice to have um, nice to have a, an opportunity to actually biblically. Uh, engage with people and and do discipleship. So, on that note, um, I will say good night. Thanks for for watching and and paying attention. And we'll see you we'll see you next week. Take care. Thank you for joining the Church Safety Guys broadcast. We hope that you found it informative, and we appreciate your feedback. Looking for ways you can help us reach more churches share our broadcast with your teams. Consider becoming a monthly ministry partner. Like and share our page and join the discussion in our Facebook groups. Visit our website at churchsafetyguys.com for other great resources. Remember to keep a servant's heart, a mindset of ministry, and semper disciplina. Always be training. Have a blessed week.